Okay, we're back. We're live. Energy 808, the cutting edge, uh, with my co-host, uh, if you will, Marco Mangelsdorf of Provision Solar and Hilo, and Senator Russell Ruderman, uh, a state senator in the Hawaii legislature. Welcome, you guys. So nice to have you here. Aloha. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thank so you, let's, Jay. let's talk about something. Let's follow up on something that Marco and I have talked about before. Huho Nua. Okay, Huho Nua has been around the block for a very, very long time. In fact, it's one of those projects that has sort of lasted forever. As a matter of fact, it's one of those projects where the environment, I mean, not only the environment up in the air, but the environment legally, socially, economically has so drastically changed that it has been overtaken by events in every way you can imagine. Um, and the, the Supreme Court, uh, on, I guess it was an appeal by uh, Life of the Land, was it? Um, they, they turned around a, an approval by the PUC and referred it back to on remand of the PUC. And the PUC thought about that for a while and decided no permit. Um, can't do this project. This does not satisfy our uh, environmental standards, um, air quality you know, emission standards. Okay, And they said no. And now it's up for reconsideration, a motion for reconsideration by the, the capital concentration that has been trying to put it together, who say they have invested 350 million American dollars. Um, okay, so uh, Russell, you wrote a letter uh, to the PUC about this, and that is something when the state senator writes a letter. Uh, what did you say in the letter? It was last week, wasn't it? It was actually about uh, five days ago, I think. Um, you know, another senator had written to the PUC something that I took great issue with, uh, who doesn't live on the Big Island and was giving incorrect information that that uh, has been circulating around here, and I wanted to correct. Uh, so, I I just wanted to point out to, as the PUC well knows, I want to let them know that some of us senators and some of us Big Island ratepayers are aware that this project would increase our rates unnecessarily. And the reasons that they were told to reconsider it were completely valid reasons that benefit here on the Big Island. You know, you mentioned the environmental concerns, but uh, uh, I think the thing that got sent back to the PUC was an exemption from competitive bidding so that they didn't have to compete or, you know, uh, electrically. And you, you hit the nail on the head, Jay, when you said the environment has changed, the environment around the energy sector has changed so much because now we have solar plus storage uh, at the utility scale. And it's much, much cheaper than we could imagine 10 years ago when this project started. And so to, to allow it to come online at this, without ever having had competitive bidding on behalf of us ratepayers, was was just improper, the wrong thing to do. And I believe that the Supreme Court also said that the PSC had failed to consider, you know, environmental costs. So uh, those are two things. I don't know which one sent it back, but so I wanted to point out that there's a disinformation campaign going around that my mm -hmm. colleagues, for example, use the phrase uh, uh, costlier, inter costlier intermittent solar than this green facility. And it's like, there's so many falsehoods built into that one statement because our, our new solar is not intermittent. It's not costlier. And this plant isn't green and, and we don't want it. And you know, I understand the, the, big, the big argument now in favor of it is jobs. It's, we all want jobs, you know, but do any certain set of jobs justify raising the rates for all Big Island people who already pay the highest rates in our state and suffer from the worst poverty? Is it really right to raise the rates of anybody because of one company's desire to have those jobs? Or you know, is that a shared burden that we all have? Not to mention the environmental costs, which has also changed since they started. I mean. When this project started, I thought, yeah, it seems a good idea. We got to do something with those trees. Let's burn them, frankly. And I stayed out of it. And then along came Greta Thunberg and the realization of the climate crisis they were in. And we cannot, here on our big island, embark on 30 years of not only cutting down the trees that are the carbon sink, but then burning them to add carbon to the air. Pretending that's carbon neutral doesn't make it carbon neutral. It's a disaster for our climate carbon. 
So there's two giant reasons why we, we can't allow it to proceed. Their exemption from competitive bidding apparently was never legal. So, you know, the, the, the blame for the failure at this point in time has to be shared all around. Yeah, well, good for you for speaking out on that. I, I hope, uh, you know, it has an effect on things. I believe it will have an effect on things. At the end of the day, it's not good for Hawaii. It's not good for the Big Island. And, right. um, and these guys should have known going in, or at least somewhere along the way, that the project doesn't work. The technology is old. The technology is not efficient. Somewhere along the way, it must have become obvious to them. Marco, you have specific thoughts about this too. What are your thoughts? I do, I do. And I just want to uh, reiterate my support to, to Russell and to Henry Curtis, uh, because there's a very, very small number of us who have uh, uh, had the temerity to speak out publicly in support of this decision and order by the commission of several weeks ago. Uh, the folks at Huho Noa have done a masterful job uh, essentially running the table, so to speak, using Las Vegas terms in terms of getting their message out and having journalists uh, cover it uh, just the way they would like, which is to, like Russell was saying, focus on jobs. And every few weeks, it seems, the Huho Noa folks trot out a new number of how much they've spent. Not too long ago, it was 330 some odd million. Last week, it was 400 million. Who knows what it's going to be this week or next week? And you know, this has been an odyssey going on for close to 10 years now, close to 10 years. And uh, I think back to what if, uh, what if Helco had taken an off ramp two years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, uh, then, you know, where would we be now? I think we'd be better off. And I don't want to do too much, you know, kind of morning, Monday morning quarterbacking here. But at the same time, uh, I just can't, from any perspective, see this as beneficial to, to rate payers and to the people of this island, the people of the state. And something that has received zero attention, gentlemen, zero attention, is who's behind this project? Where's the money coming from? It is completely, from what I can tell, completely opaque. If you go to the BREG, the business registration website, DCCA, there, there are no clues to follow. There, a, there are a so-called foreign, foreign company, okay? Foreign meaning outside of Hawaii, uh, with some type of Delaware pedigree, perhaps, uh, to some degree, but I've had people a lot brighter than I am who have spent some time trying to dig into the money, uh, the money trail, follow the money. You know, that famous uh, saying from uh, Deep Throat back in the days of Woodward's and, uh, Woodward and Bernstein in terms of the, the Nixon corruption. And it seems to me that with one of the major biggest infrastructure projects of this island in decades, that there should be some greater clarity and transparency in terms of where's the money coming from okay. who is behind this beyond their their their, okay. their propaganda campaign marco we're going to take a short break right now we'll take a short break and uh, do some public service announcements and then we'll be right back Okay, we're back with Energy 808, the cutting edge. Okay, Marco, you were expressing some thoughts about uh, what this all means in a larger context. Please continue. Yeah, just uh, focusing on the money trail, Jay, that, uh, you know, if you take Huono at face value, okay, they've spent 400 million bucks. That's, that's quite a bit of money. Who is behind it? Which, which investors? Under what terms? I mean, Henry Curtis has tried on a number of occasions through the docket through IRs, information requests, to try to dig into and get information from Huhonua. Huhonua has blocked, blocked, blocked every attempt that I know of, oh, saying it's not pertinent, it's not relevant, and they've refused. So we've got a number of local people, uh, Warren Lee, former president of Helco, someone I've worked with over the years, a number of years ago, who are out there bashing the commission, using words such as we're appalled, uh, Warren saying, I'm appalled at what the commission did. 
I've never seen in the 20 years I've been in the arena here, I've never seen the type of personal, seemingly personal attacks from these parties to the commission. And I find that to be, is it a sign of the times in terms of the dialogue is degrading to the point of you don't like a decision you go after in, in, in somewhat offensive terms when you have a decision you don't like? I don't know. I don't know, but it's deeply disturbing to me. On the merits, it was absolutely the right decision. Kuhonua has the right to ask for a reconsideration, which they did last Monday. The commission has said, we are leaving open until uh, August 10th, August 10th, the end of, uh, is that next week? Or approximately two weeks from now for any commentary. And I can guarantee you they're gonna be person after person who is gonna be sending commentary to the commission saying, we support jobs, we support jobs, we support jobs. So, I expect the commission will issue a decision or within a fairly short amount of time, uh, most likely reaffirming their original decision. And then it's, uh, okay, what's the next step? What's the next shoe to fall? And it's uh, quite possibly gonna be a lawsuit. So uh, crazy times we live in then. Crazy times we live in. Russell, you had more on this too. Well, it's something that Marco said reminded me of some you know, the fact that it is, in fact, not a local company, but a, quote, foreign corporation, unquote. Because this big part, I mean, I live here in East Hawaii and I read the paper and the PR campaign is the PUC is some outsiders. That why, why is the PUC from Honolulu controlling what we do here on the big island? And you know, while I sympathize with that, sometimes it's nonsense in this case, because first of all, this is a foreign corporation trying to get around our laws here on the Big Island. And let's remember who the PUC is. It's the Public Utility Commission. They're on our side and they're in Honolulu because it's a state-like commission. The PUC is defending our rates, Warren Lee and whoever is behind Kuhunua or Honua Ola, they're not defending our island or our interest, the PUC is. So it's just doubly ironic the way they, the way they use that, as if the PUC was this evil outsider. So what's going to happen on this motion for reconsideration? I, uh, you know, motions for reconsideration are not easily granted in courts or in the PUC. Um, you have to really come up with some compelling stuff. Uh, do you know what that stuff is here? And is there any chance that the PUC will, will uh, reverse themselves? Let me, let me get my crystal ball here. Hold on, guys. I'm just going to reach over here. See, here's my crystal ball. Thank you. That was uh, so it's always helpful. Yeah. I'm closing my eyes for a moment and I'm dividing. I'm divining here. So, so, so the ball says uh, more than likely the commission will reaffirm its decision. That's what the ball says yeah well you know in a motion for reconsideration you have to come up with compelling reasons and uh things that the court may have or the in this case the puc might have missed um and um and and that um the circumstances uh you know warrant a, a complete change of heart i don't know why that would be the, the case this has been something they have very very uh, carefully considered and it's in it's in uh, not to refer to your crystal ball but it's in a goldfish bowl. There's been a lot of press about this. It's not like, oh, they might have missed something. I don't think so. <laughs> this sounds like rehash from what Russell says, the, you know, the, the basis for the reconsideration and for any publicity now is just going to be rehash and it's not going to be persuasive at all. <laughs> and so let me ask you guys what happens now. Let's assume for this discussion that the PUC you know, affirms its early decision, that it denies the motion for reconsideration. What happens? What happens to this project, its mysterious investors? Uh, what happens to jobs that they're talking about? Um, what happens to energy on the Big Island? Well, uh, uh, what happens to the plant? I mean, I hope the plant can be repurposed. Energy on the Big Island will be just fine. We. Well, we lost Pune Geothermal Venture a year and a half ago, and we have not had a power outage as a result in all this time. So we had plenty of reserves, and now we're very close to a couple of new large solar plants coming on as sperm plants. So, you know, as far as do we need this project or any one project to keep our lights on? No, we don't. We're fine. 
and our rates are better without it. Now, as for what happens to the investment in the plant and the jobs, I'll let Marco answer that because he seems to have better sources of um, information. <laughs> and he's got his crystal ball, just in that's, case. <laughs> that's what. What's your answer to that? What's going to happen, Marco? What's going to happen most likely again, as I as I peer think about the crystal, is that uh, if you're who who knew and you've already spent 400 million and you've engaged law firms right and left and you're spending. Uh, what you've spent and you'll continue to spend what you need to spend to see this through to the end, uh, whatever the end is going to be, is that there will be uh, a suit filed in the Hawaii Supreme Court alleging that uh, the commission did not follow A, B, and C. And uh, as far as I understand the law, Jane, correct me if I'm wrong, they cannot uh, argue that uh, the decision was substantively incorrect, but they didn't follow the directions of the, the earlier Supreme Court decision. They didn't follow procedure. Yeah, and this would be an appeal from the decision of the POC on remand. So it's correct. whatever is in that decision and order by the Supreme Court. Remanding it is what will be tested if uh, these guys want to file another appeal. Correct. So it would play out in the court uh, for who knows how long, another 8, 12 months. And if and when the day comes when the, the, the last, truly last nails of this coffin gets pounded in and the doors shut, then what makes the most sense is you start parting out the equipment. You start trying to get some type of value for the, the investments you've already made. And uh, will you get as much as what you put in? No, that's not the way of things. But you know, you want to get something out of it uh, and you write off whatever you can. I mean, whenever you're talking about $400 million worth of investment, you've got a heck of a lot of smart accountants and lawyers to be able to do wow. whatever you can. But it sounds like a dead loss. You know, uh, Russell, you said maybe it can be repurposed, but uh, this is um, this is burning. I mean, it's got a nostalgic quality of better, like the cane fields of yore. Uh, maybe some people feel that, oh, the smoke from the cane fields was okay, therefore this is okay. Not true anymore. But the question is, how can you repurpose, um, you know, a facility that costs a lot of money uh, from burning things to some other thing, you know, process, some other technology um, to yield clean energy that doesn't give this kind of emission. So I don't know that there is such a repurposing as that, but um, let's put it, this facility, correct me if I'm wrong, Marco, this was already repurposed. It was the sugar, uh, Hilo Coast sugar processing mill, right? It was a sugar burning uh, facility at one time that was repurposed to, to burn trees. Now, I don't well, let me know. just one one small correction here, yeah. Russell. So, so during the cane days here on the island, which of course went on for many, many decades, with sugar cane essentially dying, you know, in the 1990s, uh, they were it was a gas burning plant, correct? And then they shifted over to coal. They brought uh, coal in from great distances, and Hilo Coast Processing Company, power company, was burning coal up until I believe it was 2006 or thereabouts, and then they shut down uh, burning. Coal, and then it would light and light and follow essentially until Hu Honua said we can burn something else in this plant and make money doing. Thank you for filling in those gaps, Mark. I did not know. Um, so I mean, it's already a repurposed facility, apparently twice over now. So I mean, I, I don't know what they're going to do with it. And, and the big looming, first of all, I'm sure that Hu Honua or Honua is not looking for ideas for what to do with their facility yet. They're going to like fight for another year in court and wouldn't be interested in any ideas. And, uh, um, but you know, at some point we have to figure out something to do with some of them. And, uh, it's long been said they're not the right type to make plywood out of, but it, if there's some construction material that could be made out of it, that would be a yeah. valuable thing to do with those trees. Yeah. A few of them at a time. But I, as you said before, it's not likely they'll be able to recover their investment. It's not likely this will be worth what they thought it was worth after making that huge investment. Um, well, of course not. But when people take an investment that involves risk, including legal risks that they know are unsettled questions and exemptions and fast tracks that they've taken along the way, that's that's part of the risk that they knowingly took. It's not our fault they took that risk. And it's not our responsibility to fix it for them. Well, I'm, you know, let me ask you a tough question, though, and this, this goes back to um, 
it goes back to Super Ferry and TMT and all that. So these guys were led into, or they're going to say, they have said, I'm sure, they were led into making this investment. And they went through and they dotted their I's and crossed their T's and all that. And they invested all this money over a long period of time. Okay. And it, it came apart. Uh, sort of the same way Super Ferry came apart and the same way TMT, in my view, is coming apart. Um, so the question is, uh, what message does this send to the investment community? Let's assume that with an amount of 350 or $400 million, Wall Street had to be involved. Uh, so what, what, um, what message does this send to Wall Street? Are we concerned, should we be concerned, maybe not care about what message goes and what Wall Street is going to do the next time we seek big capital for big project, any project. Well, Let me take a shot at that if I could, and then I'll like to hear what Russell says. So Wall Street is only already, Jay, running away from combustion generation. They are already the money, they're the, the money is following renewables that is cleaner than burning stuff. It's already happening. So the, Wall Street is taking away, would take away from what's going on, who honua, that investing in combustion generation is not a good idea. And that frees up money and capital to go to where it needs to go. Russell, would you add anything to that? Well, I would say, you know, I, I'm not the expert on this, but the idea that they dotted every I and crossed every T at every point along the way, I, I think can be challenged. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a, it's all as one sided as that. But I will say that, you know, I, I don't agree that we ought to be leading any investor down the rosy trail and then leaving them at the altar, you know, and say we changed our mind. I, I don't agree with that. I'm a business person myself. I don't, I think that that's terrible. I don't, that shouldn't be our outcome. But the, the companies and the developments that tend to succeed or will succeed in the future are proposing welcome developments that are community supported not not forced over the will of the community. I've had experience with this. And so maybe the message goes out is what we want in development in Hawaii is things that are good for Hawaii. And I think that message can be useful. I am not justifying the massive loss of money that some corporations may have happened, but, uh, but they're playing on this level. And as Marco said, they're playing with, they're playing with fun fire, no pun intended, and they know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, I think what you just said is really the, the, the center point uh, of this whole discussion. Because what I, what I want to ask last is what have we learned from this? And I would take from what you said, Russell, this is really a, an important point, is if, if these guys, these uh, developers, uh, investors come to Hawaii, they have to include in their thinking whether this project is going to be found good for Hawaii. It, it doesn't even matter about the law, although the law certainly counts. It, they should ask themselves on an ethical level, is this project going to be good for Hawaii? Because we are small and we are fragile and we are not all that sustainable and resilient. We have to watch out all the time uh, that we don't lose touch with our own future. And so if they don't figure that out at first, it could, it could happen this way where they, they find out the hard way. And I think you, could, you can find other examples of that. What's your reaction? Uh, the question, Marco, is um, what have we learned from this? What have they learned from this? What, they, what should they have learned from this? I'll let Russell. No, I, take that. I like the words of the previous speaker entered in the journal as if whatever happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Jay. Who, 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 who is learning what? Are you asking me? What, kind of well, what, no, I, I'm talking about the developers here. You know, I'm talking about the investors. I'm, I'm also talking about Hawaii in general. I'm talking about the government. I'm talking about the PUC. What are the lessons? I mean, this is a, it's truly in many ways a disaster, um, you know, because they came, they saw and they were conquered. <laughs> and so uh, what have we learned? What have we collectively, cumulatively as a community around energy? What have we learned? We've learned that uh, with the risk of being somewhat glib here, but very accurate nonetheless, is that we live in very uncertain times. I mean, uh, it wasn't that long ago when investing in the tourism here in a hotel 
or uh, or renting out your room uh, for Airbnb was pretty much a slam dunk because we were 10 million tourists last year and rising. We're going to be 10 million something this year. So, I mean, welcome to the new world. Welcome to the new world of uncertainty. So uh, it's, you know, I don't have any, I'd be, uh, I'd be in a different place in my life and in the world if I had answers to what do we do, what do we learn? But to me, Jay, it's learning that the degree of uncertainty that our, our species are very hubristic, sometimes arrogant, proud species has really been taken down uh, quite a number of notches these past months, speaking very personally and also looking at the macro level. So it, it's really a brave new world in terms of, of, of living and investing and I choose to see this as a tremendous opportunity. And, uh, you know, we have uh, several more months to a rather dramatic uh, election where the people will speak uh, on multiple levels. And I think we're, at a, uh, we're approaching a very positive turning point on multiple levels. I, I sure hope that's the case. I, I choose to be more optimistic and hopeful than, than, uh, than Cassandra-like that it's all coming apart the scenes. Hope not, but uh, we, we're at an inflection point for sure. And this, this coming election will be an inflection point for the country. And so, uh, Russell, I would ask you, you know, we are, we are at a time when people ask us to reimagine our economy, or reimagine our mono economy as a tourist economy. Um, and, and there are lessons in what happened here. It's the question of managing investments that come in. And of course, of investors, as I mentioned before, who should be watching to see that what they're doing comports with the quality ethical requirements of the development of, of our state, which may be changing right now. So how, how does this all play in the reimagination of our state, of tourism, of diversification, of technology? How does it all play? What, what, are, the, what are the points we can carry home out of it all for the future? Well, that's an excellent question, Jay. You know, um, I think we all can see that a big goal should be getting away from our dependence on tourism. We have to do it. It's going to be painful in the short term to do that. If we can't find the will to really support the people who lose their jobs over the paradigm shift, that's going to be really painful. But if we can't find a way to support them, I do think, you know. I've, I've, I've been in business. I've been accidentally successful in business by focusing on the basics. I, I thought the food business would be a good place to be because I get heard over and over again. Every day, over and over again. You know, it's just, it's just a, a human regular thing. And it's been successful. So my point is, we've for so long imagined tourism is going to make us uh, wealthy or uh, Attracting high tech is going to make us wealthier. S something, some high-minded thing is, is what we need. In my opinion, we need to view everything that we do in the future through the lens of what benefits the population of Hawaii. And when we do that, we'll, I think, obviously focus on three things. One's education, one's health care throughout life, and one is agriculture and food. And those are the, we have lots of cake, we have lots of seniors, we're going to need a lot of health care, we're going to need a lot of food production. There's a tremendous economy to be had supporting our own population, like every place used to do everywhere else, you know. And so if we simply focus our priorities through those lenses, what is it that the people that live here need? Let's support that and make it better. And we'll have better health care. We'll have better education. We'll have better agriculture. And then we don't really care if there's a peak and valley in tourism. That's so my thought. Who is going to well, implement you know, like, these priorities? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that. I, I kind of gave up uh, on my elected politics because I don't see anybody allowing these things to happen right now. I don't have a way politically to make it. Oh, but you have, you have the power of the pen, such as that letter last week, and you certainly have the power of coming around think tech. And, yep. uh, you know, Marco, if you didn't know, Russell Ruderman was a host for quite some time on think tech. And we I loved do. him. Yeah. And so uh, when you when you have more free time on your hands, Russell, uh, the door 
the door she is always open, you know. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. And now that we're in the world of Zoom, <laughs> we have to say that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so Marco, we're about out of time. Can you can you thank Russell and can you sort of come up with the wisdom necessary to you know to uh, wrap up on this show? Well, listening to to my friend Russell a few moments ago got me thinking, man, God, why? How come this guy isn't running for mayor? You know, he'd have my vote in a in a heartbeat. You know, and uh, I know you've been in the arena there for for as long as you you have, Russell, and you you got some plenty of wounds and scars and it's not your time now to to run for mayor but i was thinking he's the guy i want to replace harry kim you know but not not this time not this time you know russell and i will continue our odyssey together and who knows where where the path may lead so thank you thank so you. much russell for for joining us thank you marco thank you russell great to thank see you, you. Me. appreciate it let's circle back thank you so much thank aloha you.